So we've already made it to the end of phase one of Marvel's Cinematic Universe with the Avengers. Feels like we just got started, but we're actually already a third of the way through the MCU. So this is part six in my series, Journey to Marvel's Infinity War, where each week in 2018, leading up to Infinity War, I'm re-reviewing one movie in the, in the MCU in release order. If you're new to this series, the way it works is essentially I give a kind of a background of the movie, I do a review of it, I get my score on it, and also kind of talk about the connections to the MCU in general. The big idea is that I want to spark discussion, kind of re-remember these re movies as we prepare for the Infinity War event movie coming out in just a few months. Before we get started, go ahead and tell me down below in the comment section, what's your take on the Avengers? Did you see it in the theaters? All that fun stuff. Did you love it? Did you hate it? Let's spark a great discussion. With that said, let's get started and talk about the background of it. Plans for an Avengers movie go back to 2005 when producer Avi Arad secured financing from Merrill Lynch to produce 10 Marvel movies. In 2007, Zach Penn, who'd written the original draft of The Incredible Hulk, was hired to write the script. Kevin Feige's strategy for the film was to introduce the main characters in standalone films and then bring them together in The Avengers as an event. Early on, it was believed that Jon Favreau, the director of Iron Man and Iron Man 2, was the frontrunner to direct the film. But in 2009, he announced that he would not be directing the film, though he would have some input. The following year, Joss Whedon was hired to direct and rewrite the script. Whedon was not a fan of Penn's script and told the producers they should pretend this draft never happened. Eventually, both Penn and Whedon would receive story credit for the film, but Whedon alone would be credited as the screenwriter. The early drafts of the film didn't feature Black Widow at all, but instead had Wasp. In later interviews, Whedon described his early versions as very waspy. But when Scarlett Johansson was locked in and was available to be in the Avengers, they switched switched out the character for Black Widow. Upon release, the film was a massive success with audiences and critics. The film currently has a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes and it set a record for the largest opening weekend of all time in North America. Eventually, it would make $1.5 billion worldwide. So that's a little bit of background on the movie. With that said, we'll just start talking about the movie itself and we'll kick it off with the good. What can you say about this movie? It's just a bundle of joy. It's so much fun. Fun. And it's just great to see all of these characters come together in a single movie. And it works out just so well that they have great chemistry with each other. Whedon is just great at crafting stories where a group of characters that are very different from each other come together, don't get along, and come together to conquer the bad guys in the end. That's kind of what he did on television for 15 years. And then he used all of that experience, brings it together with this movie that just puts an enormous smile on your face. So, you know, I watch it pretty regularly, but it had been just enough time that it was still fresh to watch it again. Also, it was the first time I watched it with my son. So all these little moments are like, oh buddy, pay attention, pay attention. And then you'd see that big grin on his face because it's that type of movie. The way it's crafted is they just have like a wish list of if you had this group of characters, what are the scenarios that you'd want to see? Who are the characters that you'd want to duke it out? What have we never seen on screen before that we can finally pull off and make look amazing? And that's what this movie is kind of from start to finish. The plot's not super complex. It's a fairly straightforward plot that's designed to give you all of those amazing moments that you want from this batch of characters. And along the way, everyone gets a moment to shine. Even Hawkeye gets the moment where he shoots the arrow at Loki, Loki catches it, gives him this smug look, and then it explodes and it takes him out. Uh, Black Widow, you get to see her in action, tearing guys down, even like in the chair sequence, you know, the best part of the opening of the movie is her in a chair beating guys up, which is just an amazing little sequence. And it's just crafted so well, everyone gets their moment. Ever, all these wish list things you have, they're all jam-packed in this movie. And it creates a situation where like the climax of this movie, I was thinking to myself, I don't know how you make a more joy-inducing climax to a superhero movie. There might be ones that have more emotional weight because of sacrifices made or more complex story. But when it comes to just that smile on your face, I'm pretty sure this one might be the top, and I don't know how you get higher to where this one gets to. Beyond that, I alluded to it a little bit, it's, it's a really funny movie. From beginning to end, there's just these little quips, the character banter, throughout the entire movie, 
that's just so funny at times because so many of these actors are so good at being funny and in different types of ways. Chris Evans probably isn't funny like that, but he can play straight lines so well. So there's this great setup where uh, Nick Fury's like, I bet you 10 bucks or whatever that you, you, this, you'll see something crazier than this. And then they're on the aircraft carrier, it lifts up into the sky and just real subtly with the perfect look on his face, you see Captain America walk up to him, pull money out of his wallet and give it to Nick Fury. It's such a great setup and delivered perfectly. And it, it is the way he performs this character, he feels like a guy ripped out of the 40s, put into modern times that's just like, wow, gee whiz, this is incredible. And this little setup as a gag earlier, and he's like, nope, this guy blew my mind. He gets the money. And the whole movie's filled with those types of moments. So it's got qui quippy banter, great chemistry between characters, great setups for little jokes. And then there's all these little moments that are jo very Joss Whedon types of humor in the script that you couldn't really put in a sequel. The two classic moments in the climax of it, where you have Thor and Hulk standing there breathing heavily, and then you just see Hulk punch Thor. And it's just so out of the blue and just one of these things, it's so funny watching the movie. And then of course, just maybe the best laugh in the whole MCU is Loki starts going up, I am a god, I'm da, 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 going off on Hulk. Hulk just grabs him and smashes him on the ground. And you're watching this like, I can't believe they just pulled this off. That is a movie that has just nailed its tone and manages to be fun, funny, and so many other things. Along the same lines, is that you've got a movie that does have some stakes in it. It does have consequences in the events of it. Maybe later TV shows undo some of this and they found a way to make it Coulson and make it in a way that like felt like your heart's getting ripped out because of the way they had set the character up. And he'd been this side character, but they kind of elevate him, give him a lot more personality in this movie that by the time he dies, you're like, oh man, Tony Stark is pissed off and they're gonna get it after this one. Final thing I want to talk about on the good on this one is that the movie is incredibly influential, important, successful, well received by critics, and it's not pretentious at all. It doesn't seem to have a pretentious bone in its body. It's not a movie that knows, yeah, we're the Avengers, we're awesome, let's act like it. It's a movie that's not afraid to throw just goofy uh, physical humor into it with the Hulk smashing Loki on the ground like this. The story is very straightforward. It just sets up a good time. It's It just sets up a scenario where it makes sense to bring everybody together in a way that in no, in no senses at all do you feel like Whedon was full of himself when he was making this movie, or Kevin Feige's like, yeah, we figured it out, we're the kings. With that said, let's kind of move on to the mixed aspects of this movie. Really two things come to mind. The first is that the story is very straightforward, and the second is the Chitari essentially function as cannon fodder in the script. Neither one of these actually detract from my enjoyment of the film, but when I'm trying to talk about the goods and the bads of it, they are elements that kind of come to mind, because intellectually I can think, yeah, maybe the story should have a little bit more to it than Loki shows up with a plan to release a portal to let the Chitari come out to take over the Earth. But at the same time, that very thin story gives you all the story you need to give all the scenarios and enjoyment you want out of it. It's not a bad story. It's not like there's big holes in the plot. It's just very straightforward the way it works with a fairly commonly used, the bad guy wanted to get plot, wanted to get caught plot device in there. And so for some people, that could be something that for them would detr detract from the movie, be a reason that they don't care for it as much. For me, the plot it has functions properly for the movie that they created, which is we need an army big enough and a reason for that army to show up to bring all these characters together. And for that reason, this plot did its purpose to give me the movie that I wanted. And likewise, and for that same reason, I don't particularly mind that the Chitari, they're just cannon fodder for the finale of the movie, which functions. It, it just works in this movie. So many other movies, that type of thing doesn't work to just have an army show up. But I can see how for some people that would be two aspects of it that would hold it back from being 
great for them. With that said, let's move on to the bad. The thing that immediately comes to mind is Captain America's costume in this movie looks stupid. It looks cheap. It's easily the worst of the costumes in any of the movies in the MCU. I, I might even go so far to say I think this one looks worse than the one from the 1990 Captain America movie, and he has rubber ears on that one. But besides the rubber ears, I, th I don't, I don't think I have a problem with that costume. This one looks bad. From the early production images to the trailers, I thought it looked bad, and I'd kind of forgotten about it for a, for a few years, and then re-watching it this time, I was like, oh, this costume really does look pretty bad. So that's the first thing that comes to mind. The second thing, re-watching it and going into it, uh, in my last ranking video, I put this one at the top. So start watching it. The first 30 minutes or so, maybe even first 45 minutes, is a bit slow and lacking the, ener lacking the energy that comes later in the movie. As it was you're bringing the team together and we're getting these individual scenes with people. It's, it's not nearly as good as the second half of the movie. It, this is a movie where literally, if you were to rank the three acts, the best act is the third, the middle act is the second best, and the first act is easily in last place on the movie. The whole movie just gets better as it goes along. But you know, at, at the beginning, I mean, it takes 45 minutes to get everybody together. Some of the scenes aren't just kind of these knock it out of the park awesome scenes. A couple of them are. Natasha in the chair, getting the phone call. That's a great sequence. The opening one, with the shield base, it's it's okay, it's not bad. I don't have any problems with it, but it's not like a wow sequence. And so the, the beginning of the movie can feel a little bit slow, especially compared to everything else that's about to come. But that's it on the negatives for me. I, I was sitting there for a while trying to write my notes and figure out what were my big issues with this one, and it really is Captain America's costume, and the end, or the beginning isn't as good as the end. If I'm gonna score this one, I'm gonna give it a solid A. I mean, this is a very enjoyable movie that delivers on exactly what it's set out to do, and really the only things holding it back from that A plus would be it's a straightforward plot, uh, and it's a little bit slower at the beginning, and then on enjoyment level, this is a 9.5 for me. This is one of the most fun movies I, I've seen in the last 10 years. Such a big grin on my face, so many incredible moments with the characters, so many scenarios that you just to dream come true, and such a funny, quirky, interesting movie. With that said, let's start talking about the MCU connections. And I'll try and organize these a little bit. We'll kick it off talking about the cosmic stuff. At the end of this movie, Loki is captured and he's returned to Asgard with the Tesseract. So this powerful cube goes back to the cosmic realm at Asgard with Loki, which sets up events in the dark world. And at the end of this movie, Thanos is introduced, which once again, if you were there in the theater, what happened? A bunch of us going, oh, that's where this is headed. And that's where this is headed. And that's what this whole video series we're doing right here is all about. That post credit scene in the Avengers is where this thing we're doing right now, all is coming from as we're heading towards the Infinity War where Thanos finally gets into action himself. All right, from there, we'll talk about the world of the MCU on the Earth and some of the little important details in there. In this movie, we get introduced to the Bruce Banner, Hulk, Natasha relationship, which keeps expanding and we get to see it goes further in other movies in the franchise. And that is pretty important into some details as you even go into Thor Ragnarok. Another big one in this one that we learn about is the evil government agency uh, over shield tied to them, the board of heads, talking heads with Bowers Booth in there that later on in Winter Soldier, we learn more information about where that's coming from and why they're not such nice guys after all, but a bunch of connections and all of that fun stuff. And then there's a bunch of very important details when it comes to the consequences of the Battle of New York. So coming out of this one, Tony Stark is pretty messed up and that leads to the events of Iron Man 3 where he's traumatized, has PTSD coming out of it. This sets up also the Sokovia Accords that come later on in Civil War. This is the big one where governments start being like, who are these guys that are um, tearing the world apart, saving us? Are they one of them causing this? And you see that in the epilogue of this movie as they're doing the news reports. That lays the groundwork, the foundation for what becomes the events of Civil War with governments being very skeptical of what they're doing. The destruction of New York City itself is pretty important 
important to the foundation of the Marvel Netflix shows. The early on, especially like Daredevil talked about that a lot and has a bunch of real estate type stuff that leading to Kingpin actions. And it, it changed the kind of culture of the city of New York in the MCU. And that's pivotal to the Marvel Netflix shows. Along the same line, the end of this movie leaves all this alien technology spread across New York City that is very important to Spider-Man Homecoming several years later where uh, the Vulture is a construction guy that discovers all this fun stuff and then he breaks bad and becomes the Walter White of the MCU, collects all of this stuff. Instead of cooking crystal meth, he cooks up some technology to sell to people. And so that continues to be very important to the world of uh, the MCU all the way up to Spider-Man Homecoming, which I love that connection in that one. When they started off Spider-Man Homecoming and you saw what was going on with the tech. I loved that sequence. Those are the details in these little connections and how the movies intertwine. I, 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 that's the reason to me that the MCU is such a cool thing and such a unique thing that they really are intertwining the stories together and the, the events, things that happen in this movie really matter to these other movies. And then five years after the Avengers came out, Spider-Man Homecoming comes out and what happened in the Avengers matters and changed the world for Spider-Man Homecoming. Going back to what I said earlier on about the importance of stakes when it comes to movies and drama and things like that. There are stakes in these movies that have consequences. And some people view that as just a setup and tease for future movies. Is this just a promo for the next movie? No, they're all standalone stories, but what happens in one movie has consequences into the next one. You know, like good storytelling, where things matter, things have an effect on the world around them. That's why I love the MCU. Anyway, I, I made a whole list of different connections. I probably missed some important connections. Tell me down below in the comment section, which connections did I miss? Which ones uh, else are going on there? This one has a ton of them, because you had so many characters. There's so many little intertwining things that I probably missed uh, a few things in there. I, the death of Agent Coulson, there, I almost missed one. The death of Agent Coulson is very important, because that little team. TV show started up a couple years later, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., where he's the lead character. That's a pretty important event. So tell me other ones down below in the comments section. Anyway, there we have it. We've made it through phase one of the MCU. If you're new to my channel, please consider clicking that subscribe button. I do movie reviews, TV reviews, ranking videos, re-reviews like this one right here. But the key thing is I don't want to just talk about movies. I want to talk about movies with you. So join me down in the comments section, download that Stardust app, and I'll see you on Stardust. And as always, thank you so much for watching.